Welcome to Prevention 101, a five-part series exploring the foundational principles of substance misuse prevention on college campuses. This series is brought to you by the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery through The Ohio State University. Module 2 features Amy Saunders of Marshall University, who will explore how to build partnerships between campuses and communities. Amy Saunders is the director of the MU Wellness Center at Marshall University, where she oversees health and wellness initiatives on campus, including implementing evidence-based prevention and early intervention programs. She received a Master's of Arts in Psychology from Marshall University and has over 18 years of experience working in the fields of mental health and public health. She is currently working on a doctorate of education and leadership studies at Marshall. Ms. Saunders served as the supervisor for a school-based mental health program, which offered the three tiers of prevention services in five middle schools. She has over 18 years of teaching experience, including courses on developmental psychology, community public health, public policy, and ethics. She has authored and received over 20 public health-related grants. Ms. Saunders has assisted with strategic planning and coalition development on campus and within the local community and state. She is a founding member of the Cabell County Substance Abuse Prevention Partnership and the West Virginia Collegiate Initiative to address high-risk drinking and substance use, both coalitions working to provide substance use education and prevention. She currently serves as co-chair for the Marshall University Substance Use Recovery Coalition. Ms. Saunders also serves as the principal investigator for an interdisciplinary health professionals training grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This program uses an evidence-based model to provide screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment for individuals with mental health and substance use concerns. I want to thank you for allowing me to share my experience regarding the important relationship between campuses and communities. Town and gowns refer to the relationship between higher education institutions and the communities where they are located. These are often also referred to as campus community coalitions. This is the university where I work, which is located in the city of Huntington, West Virginia, and borders Ohio and Kentucky. Our campus has around 13,000 students and the city of Huntington has around 49,000 residents. The middle picture shows a picture of Marshall University, which is located centrally in downtown Huntington. It's housed on several blocks with many apartments around campus housing students. I'm not going to review the history of higher education, but I do want to make a brief mention of the fact that the relationship between towns and gowns haven't always been positive. In fact, early towns and gown relationships were often tumultuous, violent, and deadly. If we take a moment to look back at the beginning of higher education in Europe, early medieval history reveals tensions and violence between students and local town people. These groups often fought over land and they shared a mutual distress of one another due to class status. Tabitha Underwood from Missouri Campus Compact shares a brief history of this relationship and a brief introduction of town and gown relations. In 1355, riots broke out between students and townspeople on St. Scholastica's Day in Oxford. This showed the extreme violence when 63 students were killed and many injured, along with property damage to buildings and books. During the Industrial Revolution, campus expertise was seen as prestigious, but there was still a division between campus and community. The Morrell Act of 1862 made higher education began to be viewed as a public good by society. In 1945, post-World War II, higher education experienced large growth being built in enrollment. Many local leaders started to want to see colleges built in their towns. Today, in the 21st century, these relationships are viewed more positively, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today during our webinar. History has also shown us that the town and gown relationships have been a balancing act with both positive and negative effects. Underwood further shares some of the positive effects and negative effects of these relationships. On the positive side, town and gown communities experience increased population, which increases spending in businesses in the community. There are opportunities for experiential learning in the communities, providing practicum and internship placements in places like schools and in local healthcare clinics. There are also service learning opportunities which integrate community service into the classroom experience. These areas typically have increased culture and arts. Towns with institutions typically have higher education attainment, higher incomes, lower unemployment, and more diversity. However, town and gown communities have also experienced negative consequences. The transient nature of the population can decrease revenue for businesses during certain times of the year. We experience that here sometimes in our town during the summertime. 
Housing can become dilapidated. Often rental property is not cared for in the communities by the landlord. Disruptive behaviors from substance use, parties, noise nuisances, and property damages in communities. Increased strains on community systems can also occur, dealing with police and EMS. Over time, campus community coalitions began to be recognized as effective prevention strategies. Campuses began to realize that they didn't operate in a vacuum and couldn't continue to remain in silos. We began to understand that students were influenced by the community environment where they resided. In the late 1990s, the U.S. Department of Education began to address substance use in higher education, calling for campus community coalitions. Then in 2002, an NIAAA task force came out with a call to action changing the culture of drinking at U.S. colleges, which gave campuses guidances on effective strategies. It listed a comprehensive review of research on college drinking and prevention program effectiveness. The task force made several recommendations and distinguished four tiers of strategies in terms of effectiveness and ineffectiveness and the population in which the strategy was to be implemented. The tiers looked at different strategies that showed promise from individual level interventions in tier one, to effective tier two strategies that looked at community level environmental change. This was an important time in history because we began to realize that campuses and schools alone could not implement effective strategies, that the surrounding communities were just as important in achieving environmental and policy change. This was a small turning point in time for my campus. We began to organize our prevention work with others, including the Governor's Highway Safety Program, local police, campus police. At first, we focused on a few enforcement projects to curb underage drinking and drinking and driving. Our strategies were effective, but we were still missing key important stakeholders and not quite seeing the bigger picture yet. Our early work focused more on the enforcement goals and not necessarily some of the prevention programs and practices that we ne still needed to address. We began to realize that alone, we could only focus on those tier one strategies that only help individuals. And if we really wanted to experience change, we would have to mobilize the focus on other strategies like environmental change and mobilize the community. In 2005, tragedy struck my town when four teens were murdered on prom night in an alleged situation that involved drugs. To this day, the murders have never been solved. But this tragedy became the catalyst that formed our campus community coalition. After this tragic event happened, a few community members sent out a call to action looking for individuals to come and talk about substance use and violence. Several individuals answered that first call. Those individuals were comprised of people from both the community, local organizations, and campus. Together, we recognized that we had similar goals to keep this from happening again, and so we began to meet regularly, monthly, and began to lay out our plans to develop our coalition. Forming the coalition took time. We worked through some of the steps that I will describe in a moment, developing a mission, strategic plans, bylaws. We also realized that we needed funding if we were going to do substantial activities. In our town, the United Way was the organization that brought us all together, housing our funding and providing infrastructure to our coalition. We decided to apply for block grant funding from the state and realized that if we combined our forces, community individuals and campus individuals, we had a better chance of receiving it. Later, we would apply for the Drug-Free Communities Grant and receive it as well. The DFC funding helped provide even more infrastructure to our coalition and to our activities. Our coalition over time has grown in capacity and now represents many members from many various sectors, including business, law enforcement, schools, local nonprofit agencies, and several individuals from different departments on campus and just local community individuals who want to be involved. We now have over 300 youth and completed our sixth year of DFC funding. It took us a long time to develop this partnership. Uh, we started in 2005, and it took us a long time to learn to trust one another and to listen to one another and to see what each of us had to offer in terms of expertise. Marshall has been an active participant since the beginning, providing support for multiple activities and resources. We are actually getting ready to host those 300 youth on campus this week for their annual teen prevention summit, which I see as a win-win. Each year, our town celebrates the lives of these four young members who were lost in our community way too soon. Their memory lives on in the work that we provide. Prior to this event, our campus was mainly focusing on individual prevention programs and intervention strategies addressing substance use with our students. After this event, we began to see the bigger picture. 
One of the first important steps we took as we began to form our campus community coalition was to assess our community's readiness. Early on, our community was at a level two, so we knew that before we could implement any strategies, we had a great deal of education to provide to the community. Over time, our campus community has been able to implement multiple successful prevention strategies using expertise from around the table in our coalition. We've been able to use the campus resources to help with evaluation and research. The project in the top area was a GIS mapping project that was completed by our coalition using geology graduate students from Marshall University. The students were able to show relationships between bar density around campus and violence in the community. This prompted our local officials to address needed enforcement in these areas. Our coalition has also provided evidence-based programs both on campus and within the local schools in the community. On campus, we deploy programs like BASICS, Alcohol EDU, and in the local schools, we've used NREP and used programs like Too Good for Drugs to implement prevention-based strategies from, all, from our elementary schools all the way through our high schools. We've also been able to raise the community's awareness after multiple education campaigns. We would not have been able to accomplish any of this work on our own. Campus Community Coalitions provided the networking and collaboration to implement these and many other successful strategies. Not only are Campus Community Coalitions important, but coalitions should also think broader and think about the importance of statewide coalitions. Early on, as campus coalitions began to form, some campus administrators appeared worried about joining or advocating for campus community coalitions because it might appear as though their campus had a problem. Statewide coalitions became a great way for campuses to get involved and to take that pressure off. Not only were they a great way for campuses to get involved, but they also allowed for activities including policy development on a higher level because partners in these groups also involve state agencies. In our state, most of our campus community coalitions are also affiliated with this statewide coalition. This is one of our statewide coalitions, coalitions that focuses on substance use and mental health for college-age students around the state. Our statewide coalition actually formed in 2001 before our campus community coalition. We have been able to work on policy at the statewide level and implemented multiple evidence-based practices and programs at all of our participating campuses. As I review the importance of collaboration and partnership between campus and community coalitions, I thought it would be helpful to use some important models or frameworks that might help highlight the importance of these issues. These frameworks are great tools for individuals who are new to the prevention field. Many of these models have some overlap and have been around for a while, but they are extremely important in organizing campus community coalitions. As new groups become ready to develop and build their coalitions, CADCA, the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, is a great resource and has already done the research and provided steps to coalition building. CADCA is a great organization for someone who's new to the prevention field. I mention this now because I think these steps illustrate the importance of what can happen when you develop campus community coalitions, focusing on these important steps. By ourselves, we can only focus on a small section. We can only focus on those individual interventions. But together, we can mobilize the community to achieve population level change. One of the first steps forming a coalition is to clarify, reaffirm your vision and mission. If these aren't the same, think about what common ground you can work on. For our coalition, we focused early on on underage drinking but has changed over time and has needed to be reevaluated and reassessed as our community has changed. Now we focus on youth from our elementary schools all the way up through our college population, and we look at substance use more broadly. The second step is to engage communities in the coalition. Assess the awareness and motivation to act and see where coalitions at. For example, will we focus on alcohol or drugs or both? Your community could be in a different place from the campus on this issue. We need to remind ourselves to assess where our community is on each issue we address to avoid wasting time and precious resources. If we design interventions that the community is not ready to implement, we will not be successful. When we first started again in 2005, our community readiness was around us too. So we knew that we had a lot of education work to do before we could even get started on implementing strategies. Recently, our coalition was given a large number of needle disposal boxes, and we are currently assessing the community's thoughts on needle disposal boxes to better know where to place them. 
We've received a lot of mixed messages and some negative feedback from the community about these. On one hand, they are complaining about discarded needles, but they are also ill-informed on needle exchange programs and harm reduction. They believe that dropping having needle boxes promotes drug use. So we are trying to educate the community that having these boxes helps actually decrease infectious disease caused by needle sharing by individuals who use drugs. Step three is solidifying collaborative infrastructure and processes. Think about what you can do for me, what can I do for you, and think about what we can do together. Really, we have to understand that the people around the table have valuable assets and expertise that you don't have. They may ha have resources in their organizations, they may have expertise, they may have important networking connections as well. I constantly tell people that I'm not an expert when it comes to substance use prevention, but together we can all learn from one another to develop effective solutions. Step four, recruit and retain active diverse partners. These members should be from the campus community. They should be stakeholders and key players. You can realize sometimes that just because the campus represented doesn't mean that you always have a good fit or that you have the right people around the table. You need to think strategically about how the right people around the table to foster collaboration. I've also learned that over time, these individuals can change. For example, our campus community coalition now has pharmacy school members involved. They help us with prevention and education programs in our schools and in our local community and have been a valuable asset to our coalition. Think about what your coalition wants to address and who is best equipped to do that. If you're focusing on youth in the schools, then you really need to have stakeholders from around the schools at your table. Step five, develop leaders. Many individuals will rise to the top and want to be involved with leading the coalition, which is a great thing. But sometimes we need to think about educating them with the current information strategies. Attending CADCAS conferences are perfect for this. Step six, market your coalition. It's important to publicize meetings and share what you're working on with others promote your coalition's work, and when you implement a strategy such as a social marketing campaign or a sticker shock program, be sure to include your coalition's name. That helps get the information out to the community and lets the community know what's happening. Step seven, focus on action. It's so easy to focus on the problems and get stuck in the negativity, but it's important for coalitions to stay focused on what needs to be done and how you're going to do it. Think about your actions and who's doing it and when it's going to happen. That will help move the campus coalition along. Finally, step eight, which is critical. Think about evaluation and how you're going to sustain your coalition. Evaluation is critical. You must evaluate all that you do to show that it's effective. You don't want to waste precious time and you don't want to waste precious funding or resources on strategies that are not effective. Another important model is SAMHSA's SPIF, which stands for the Strategic Prevention Framework. SPIF has been around for many years and provides a good logic model for coalitions to follow. There are more in-depth logic models of the SPIF that provide step-by-step -step actions, making it easy for coalitions to follow and implement. I mention it briefly here because I want individuals who are new to the prevention field to be aware of it. The steps are similar to some of the steps that we just discussed from CADCA. Um, assess the need, step one. What's the problem and how can I learn more? Why is this happening here? Those are some of the things that you might look at when you're assessing need. Step two is building capacity. Where is your community and what resources are out there? What are other things that we need to think about in terms of community capacity? Where is our community in terms of readiness? Step three is the plan. What should I do and how should I do it? Step four is how you're gonna implement it, putting your plan into action, and step five is evaluating it, how it's gonna succeed. That's the second time that we've heard the word evaluation. Evaluation is critical for campus community coalitions in order to make sure that they're being effective and using their precious resources effectively. In the middle, you will notice the word sustainability and cultural competence. Sustainability is important because it lets the coalition know how the work is going to continue. It's important for coalitions to think in terms of staffing, infrastructure, and funding, and other issues related to sustainability. We often think about if somebody's going to leave a position in our coalition, how are we going to sustain it until we are able to fill that position? If we are going to lose funding, how would we be able to sustain our activities until we can find funding to replace it? Those are important things for campus community coalitions to think about. 
Finally, cultural competence involves understanding and appropriately responding to the unique combinations of cultural variables in your community. These include things like ability, age, belief, ethnicity. Culture is always present and should be reviewed. For example, one of the things that we learned about our culture here is that Appalachian culture and the drug epidemic is that we tend to share our prescriptions. This created a unique education opportunity for our campus coalition and even our statewide coalition to focus on education to, these to our population in order to affect population change. One more model that I want to share is the socio-ecological model. Early public health models were great and focused on population level change. The public health model demonstrated that problems arose through relationships and interactions among an agent, for example, like alcohol or drugs, a host, the individual, and the environment, the social or physical context of the substance use. These relationships compelled coalitions to think in a more comprehensive way, and over time, the public health model has proven to be one of the most effective approaches to creating and sustaining change at a community level. The socio-ecological model has been built off of that public health model, and it's by far one of my favorite models in prevention work. This model helped provide the framework to look at different systems, from individual interventions that were maybe happening on campuses, or in an organization in a community to looking at organizational, community, and public policy. The socio-ecological model really started to frame the importance of what I believe is the Campus Community Coalition. This model demonstrated the importance work that were happening on campuses, but also how the Campus Community Coalitions and statewide coalitions could start to affect population level change. I wanted to briefly mention collegiate recovery programs, which have been around for about 30 years, and early programs have included Texas Tech and Rutgers University. Today, there are over 150 different types of collegiate recovery programs. It's important to not only think about prevention in terms of individuals who have never used substances, reducing use with students who are currently using, thinking about harm reduction for individuals who need to decrease use, but it's also important to think about prevention in terms of prevention strategies for individuals in recoveries, not only on our campuses, but in our community, and thinking about ways to bridge this topic between campus community coalitions. Recovery programs can help change the culture on campuses and in the community and should be active members on your campus community coalitions. Coalitions should be thinking about preventative steps to help individuals maintain their recovery, and campus community coalitions are important to start looking at the socio-ecological needs around this issue. I wanted to share a couple of other important resources that are out there for new individuals who are in the prevention field. I've already mentioned the NIAAA's Call to Action, CADCA, SAMHSA, SPIF, but I'd also like to tell you about a few other resources. One of those is the College AIM from NIAAA. This document actually provides research on both individual and environmental level strategies and examines the cost effectiveness of these strategies. While we may be implementing something on campus, we are using our campus coalition to help decide what those interventions are going to be on our campus. Our campus coalition helps assist us in providing programs like Alcohol EDU on our campus and tips training for universities. Another important resource is SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. This resource provides a plethora of prevention programs, and it's very helpful to search for populations where you might want to implement programs. Many local prevention programs that are happening in our local schools have been identified off of the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs, and our Campus co Community Coalition is helping implement those in the schools. Another great resource is the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery. I'd recommend all prevention providers signing up for their U report. This will provide very helpful information to students, especially if they want to learn more about recovery. Finally, I'd like to share IRETA, which is, which is the Institute for Research, Education, and Trainings in Addiction. While it is geared more at treatment, they offer free trainings and they often discuss prevention and intervention research. Finally, I'd like to leave you with a few lessons learned. First, campus community coalitions allow us to reach community and population level change. Before, when we were working in our silos, we were often only focusing on individual level change. But by coming together and working together towards a common goal, we've been able to focus on more population level change. I think it's important to think about language. You're also gonna learn a great deal of new language in this field. 
there are two things I'd like to say about language. One, language is important to reduce stigma for individuals who are working in this field. And it's important that we use the right language when talking to individuals or delivering messages about prevention or education. I think it's also important for coalitions, campus community coalitions, to think about having cheat sheets for individuals who may come to their coalition meetings. For example, we use a lot of acronyms in this field, and individuals who are new to this field or community members who come to the table often don't understand that language. So it's, I think it's important for campus community coalitions to think about a way or having a uh, important info sheet to tell them what information means. I think it's important for everyone to make space and remember to diversify your coalition. Remember that everybody's voice is important. Remember, evaluation is critical, and you have to evaluate everything you do in order to make sure that your interventions are successful and you're using your resources to the best of your ability. Finally, the most important thing that you can think about in terms of a campus community coalition is its people. 